Okay. Hi, I'm Meta Spencer. I'm in Toronto, and we're going to Ottawa today. We're going to Canada's national capital to talk to a woman who's running for the uh, 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 for Parliament in uh, Ottawa's Central Riding. So we get to do we have to talk politics today. Only really, I want to talk about something that's not just for any any one election, but more generally about how we can be more equitable in the distribution of of the wealth in, in this society and in all the other societies, because I don't think there's any on the planet now that's really totally fair. Uh, so we're going to talk about that. Um, hello, Angela McEwen. It's good to meet you. It's nice to meet you too. Thanks so much for inviting me. You are um, a senior economist at the Canadian Union of Public Employees, fam familiarly called QP in Canada, and uh, you're a uh, senior, you're a fellow or something at the Broadbent Institute, which is, uh, I guess I should say that Edward Broadbent is a former uh, leader of the New Democratic Party, which obviously you are running for in his party <laughs> and he uh he actually represented this riding that i'm running in as well for a little while i see it's been about 20 years since he was uh, the leader wasn't it yes yes you know he's he's a good guy yes. and i imagine his institute is also an, a, a good outfit right Yes, they do a lot of, of fantastic work. And on this issue of taxing the rich, uh, QP and Broadbent Institute and some other organizations are running a campaign right now. And your book's title is Share the Wealth. Yes. Which, uh, <laughs> Thomas Piketty made big, big waves about eight or 10 years ago, I guess, with the book about the notion that you can't just even things out by taxing income. You actually actually have to tax people's holdings as well. So uh, that made sense to me. And I don't know whether that's what you say in your book or not, but the title of the book suggests that it might be. So let's, why don't you tell me what's in your book? You are co-author with John Jonathan Govan. Uh, all right. And so Jonathan is the director of policy in the leader's office with the NDP. Uh, he contacted me in December, so the end of last year, asking if I would be interested in working on a book with him. There was Piketty that has done a lot of work in France. And then in the States, there's um, Gabriel Zuckman, who has done a lot of work uh, on the idea of a wealth tax and, and taxing wealth in, in the United States. Um, and Senator Elizabeth Warren, who is a politician, but also, you know, incredibly um, bright policy mind as well had mm -hmm. proposed a wealth tax so this idea is gaining idea or gaining momentum globally it and certainly ought to yeah as as it should so if we look at the way that wealth inequality has increased in canada over um the past 30 years or so uh so we show in the book that it, it has actually increased quite quite dramatically, the top 1% uh, of wealth holders have doubled their wealth in the past 20 years. And the bottom, you know, 90% have just, it just increased it by a little bit. And most of that increase is in the value of people's homes. Uh, and so that's not really a super useful increase for people. It's not something that you can uh, do a lot with. Because uh, if you sell your home, you need to, you obviously need to live there, right? So uh, it's not it's not the same type of wealth increase that we're talking about. But then we also talk about the way that wealth inequality and income inequality are connected. So the 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 ratio of income for the top CEOs in Canada has also increased dramatically. Mm -hmm. And the last report that the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives put out, CEOs in Canada, the top 100 CEOs, make 200 times more than the average worker in Canada. Mm -hmm. And back in 1998, the first time they did it, it was 100 times more. So that, that salary for CEOs that is often partly paid in wealth, they're paid in stocks and, mm -hmm. and um, 
other other types of you know it's not just a salary they get bonuses and and stocks and, mm-hmm. and value like that that income has has just exploded at the very top and if you look at who these ceos are they often have family connections um, to the wealthiest families in canada so very often you'll find that the you know the daughter of a billionaire is the CEO of mm. another company or somebody that, um, you know, starts out in one company, then is on the board of a whole bunch of other companies and they get uh, paid quite handsomely to be on the boards of these other companies. So the connections between uh, the biggest and most profitable corporations in Canada and the, the wealthiest families in Canada mm-hmm. is, is quite striking as well. Mm-hmm. And then if you think about how intergenerational uh, inequality comes about, where the wealthiest pay for the best things for their kids, they get them tutors, they send them to the, the most exclusive schools, they, um, they get them the best internships, so they pay their salary so they can afford to take these unpaid internship opportunities using the networks that their families have. So that wealth actually inequality in a number of different ways exacerbates income inequality and creates uh, a situation where uh, the economist Miles Korak has called it the Great Gatsby Curve, where in Canada, intergenerational inequality is actually getting worse. What we have from governments is a situation where they've cut taxes and that's gone into the pockets of the wealthy. And then they've cut transfers to public services which has taken away resources from the least wealthy. And so these, there's been these series of government decisions that have exacerbated both wealth and income inequality. Mm-hmm. And so we say in order to combat that, in order to reverse that effect, you have to take a number of measures, taxing both wealth and income more progressively, and then invest that money in the public services, reinvesting in healthcare and childcare taking action on climate change because it's often the poorest communities that bear the consequences of climate change. If you saw in BC, the forest fires, it's small rural communities that are being evacuated, that are losing their homes. When you see flooding, it's it's not the super wealthy that are, are facing those consequences of climate change. It's often indigenous communities, farming communities, rural areas that don't have, have the resources to um, to actually protect themselves from from the consequences here. I'm sure there are lots of people who've done the comparisons, but I haven't I haven't been reading them. That is a comparison of different countries because mm. this kind of thing is going on worldwide. I don't know how bad Canada is in the global hierarchy of unfairness. <laughs> <laughs> That's an excellent point. We do point out other countries that have made some better decisions uh, than Canada has. And we we say that, you know, we're not as bad as the United States. You see the very extreme income inequality there. You see the fact that they don't have health care, actually. Um, having access to public health care, even though it's not fully public, even though we don't have head to toe health care. Um, having that access actually, you know, mediates inequality somewhat mm-hmm. uh, compared to what they have in the United States. Mm-hmm. Um, but that that comparison doesn't mean that we're good if we compare us to lots of other uh, countries like Sweden or, you know, the, the typical ones, uh, the Northern European countries that have a social welfare state that have invested more in um those public services and have well, we hear of Scandinavia as the paragons they're the best in the world I don't know which countries in Scandinavia are the best Norway I gather has a very good reputation but um what else I mean what other countries uh, is I, I I hear good things about New Zealand but it's almost as if all the good guys are in one club, uh, no matter what the issue is, whether it's income equality or global warming or standing up for against nuclear weapons or whatever, all of the issues that make a, pers- a country or into a saintly outfit. 
is uh, they 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 are clustered together. Is, is that right? Now, are there any exceptions? Are there any uh, highly equal countries that are right wing in other respects? That is a really good question, and I actually don't know the answer. You could imagine a country um, that is more authoritarian uh, also being more equal. But when I think about countries that that uh, I admire the policy of, I do. I think of New Zealand. Um, I think of Bhutan, where the king—that's a kingdom—but mm-hmm. uh, they have prioritize the well-being of people Um, and so they think about things a little bit differently in Canada in the United States even in even in these social democratic European countries I mean again they're better than we are but they're still largely following the same global policy recommendations which are to lower corporate taxes to encourage investment uh, to sign trade deals um, as many trade deals as you can kind of thing um, and to prioritize the rights of corporations over the responsibilities to the environment and to each other and um, and countries have I think kind of varied on that path to the extent to which they're they're following those policy that 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 policy consensus that grew out of Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher and in Canada uh, Brian Mulroney um, and which which continued on with Jean Chrétien, we point out in the book. They continued to cut corporate taxes. They continued to cut um, taxes on uh, capital gains, mm-hmm. which is actually hugely beneficial for the top 1% and costs us um, around uh, $20 billion a year in tax taxes that, that we don't take in in revenue because we don't tax capital gains the same, same as income. So that is, that is a huge beneficial tax on wealth that uh, is, is, a, is a problem. And we say, you know, you can have a, a wealth tax, a 1% wealth tax on income over, say, $10 million, nets you $10 million a year. Uh, but moving capital gains from 50% inclusion to 75, that also gets you $10, $10 billion a year. So if you went to 100%, that'd get you $20 billion a year. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's a lot of money by by this preferential treatment of of money that comes from the sale of assets like stocks. Explain capital gains. Okay, that's where sure. I need, where I'm okay. I messed up. I don't really understand it. So capital gains are, is the difference between the value of something when you bought it and when you sell it. So it's that growth in value over the time that you owned it. So let's say you bought some stocks. Um, in uh, Hudson's Bay, you know, you, or you got them uh, when you worked there. So you, you have a uh, hundred stocks in, in Hudson's Bay and you've held them for 30 years and now you want to sell them, you know, in order to retire or, or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and the value of those stocks have increased, let's say it doubled. So you, you bought them for $100 and you sell them for $200. That means that you've had a profit on the value of those stocks of a hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. So rather than counting that hundred dollars as income and taxing that at your whatever your marginal income tax rate is, you will only include half of it as income. And so if you instead of paying income tax on a hundred dollars, you only pay income tax on fifty dollars. And so lots of um, small, smaller uh, Canadian businesses can actually structure their operations so that they take money out of their company as capital gains instead of as income. So they can, st- they can set up a second company where you transfer, you have this company buy the stocks from this company with return or with retained earnings as part of that. And then they sell it and you get the profit. And so instead of you taking that money as salary or as dividends, you take it as capital gains and now you pay half the tax on it that you would if you got it a different way. So accountants can kind of set up these schemes so that you get the preferential tax tax treatment. 
Now, in 1966, there was a Royal Commission on Taxation. Kenneth Clark uh, led this Royal Commission. And at that time, capital gains weren't taxed at all in Canada. There was no tax on it. So if you were able to get income out of a company in the form of capital gains, uh, you that was free. The profit was free. You didn't have to pay any tax on it. And the commission decided that wasn't fair, that no matter how you received the income, whether it was through employment income or through dividends, and dividends are when you own a stock and the company decides to distribute the profit to all the shareholders, like they have a really good year. So they give everybody an equal share of the profit. That's a dividend. And so the company has already paid corporate income tax on that and they give it to you, and then you pay personal income tax on that. But they take account of what the company's already paid. So it's it's equal. So dividends are fairly equally taxed compared to, to income, but capital gains are not. And so he said now, it should be- where did you get this 50%? Where did that come from? So so the, the commission set, recommended that capital gains be taxed at 100%, because they said that's a growth in profit, that hasn't, no one's paid any tax on that growth. So you should, it should just be the same as, as um, being taxed. It's the same as money that you get from anywhere else. So the commission recommended that it be taxed at hundred percent, but by the time the law was implemented and the reform was done, they only taxed it at 50%. So that was because there was a, a significant amount of lobbying from, you know, owners of corporations who had structured their their companies in such a way as to take advantage of this loophole. And so they, they only did it at 50%. Brian Mulroney in the 80s moved that up to 75%. Um, and so it was at 1.75%. Then um, Paul Martin comes along and um, in the, the mid 1990s, we cut transfers to provinces because we have to tighten our belt. Once we've tightened our belt and the budget's back in balance, does he start giving money back to public services? No, they cut the capital gains rate from 75% back down to 50 in 2000. And so that has, that has been a significant cut. I mean, we could have funded childcare since 2000 with that amount of money, but instead they returned it to the wealthiest, the pockets of the wealthiest. Okay, what kind of rationale do they offer when they try to say that it shouldn't be taxed the same as profits on anything else? Well, they say we need to encourage investment, that um, investment drives growth. And so uh, they should get this tax savings in order to encourage people to invest money. Uh, But the counter argument to that is that um, where we have natural experiments, economists have looked at this and differing rates on capital gains actually doesn't make a big difference in terms of the supply of savings or investment. It really, because it is so targeted at the top income earners. And because it is such a difference between other ways of them getting income, all it does is just distort uh, tax planning. It's basically a loophole that the very, very wealthy can take advantage of. And so there's a very good argument to say, maybe, maybe have it at 90%, like maybe give them a little bit of an incentive, but that there is absolutely no economic rationale for it to be 50% for it to be that big Mm -hmm. of of an incentive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what about if you compare it to other countries? Uh, What, uh, there must be some variation in how much uh, other countries tax capital gains. That is true. Yes. And Canada is actually unique among wealthy countries in that we tax capital gains at a lower rate than dividends. Most countries tax capital gains at a higher rate than dividends Mm -hmm. because dividends already had corporate income tax paid on them. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that it it actually, the UK um, also taxes capital gains more favorably than dividends, but at a higher rate than we do in Canada. So this is one area where Canada is not consistent uh, with the global norms. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, well, there are people who say, uh, if we increased, uh, we raised taxes on corporations and business and so on, that this would simply mean people would take their money and go to other countries. Uh, and I, I don't know whether there's anything to that. To what extent is, is that true? Or do, does anybody really know how true it is? So again, looking at, at research on what has happened when countries have increased their tax taxes on corporations uh, is that for the most part, it is not true uh, that because what um, corporations don't make investment decisions based on tax rates alone. What they want is, you know, they want somewhere where there is a talented labor force that they can hire. Um, they want societies that that uh, don't have crime, that are largely, you know, peaceful and e equality like matters to that environment. They want stable policy. They don't want rules changing. They want stable regulation, uh, but they, they don't generally chase. Now some will, uh, but you know what? Good riddance. I don't, I don't think that those are the types of companies that are gonna make the investment in the people or the communities where they're located. If that tiny uh, difference in tax is going to change your decision, that's okay. Uh, and if we look at Canada and what types of investment we have in Canada and what Canada's billionaires own, they own grocery stores, <laughs> they own gas stations. Mm -hmm. And so that investment, if the billionaires decide to leave, someone else is going to run that grocery store. And maybe they'll run it more fairly and pay their workers a better wage and have you know, more local produce. So it's not necessarily um, a zero sum game. Now, globally, I do think we need to stop this race to the bottom. And that's why the discussions around a global minimum corporate tax are actually really exciting and interesting. And so I think that that uh, Canada should definitely continue to participate in that. I think we this, also... This is what uh, just happened recently. At yes. G7 or something maybe. And there, it, it didn't sound like very much. That there was a, a minimum of 15%. Are yes. there some countries that still don't tax at all? And, and this, this was going to make a difference. I think Ireland said that they're not going to go along with it. Which, you know, now there's a, an example of a country that's a good, a good country. But in this case, it sounds like a bad bad country. <laughs> well, and they found, so they, they had 0% corporate tax and, and for a while it worked to attract uh, companies there, but it didn't last. Um, and mm -hmm. so over the, over the long term, it actually, they didn't, they didn't end up better off. The economy didn't grow enough to make up the lost revenue from the corporate taxation. And so there's some really good economic research. Ireland is one of those examples of where it does not make sense to cut corporate taxes to try to attract that investment. It's just there's so many other factors at play uh, that, that, yeah, you end up losing too much. Well, people who, who talk about globalization, and you haven't even used the word, um, uh, uh, often root I think primarily refer not to the rate of taxation in different countries, but but the cheap labor force and so on. The people talk about countries moving to China or Mexico or you know Indonesia or someplace because they can they can produce things for much cheaper rates. Yeah, and if you talk to any large manufacturer, if you talk to a large auto manufacturers or any anyone. Um, really, they all talk about their low cost nation partners. And so it is um, in in manufacturing, it's it's absolutely pervasive, there is um, manufacture. So I've talked to so I used to work for the Canadian Labor Congress. And the Canadian auto workers used to be part of the Canadian Labor Congress. And so I would talk to auto workers who actually had been sent to Mexico to train their replacements. They were, they were going to be fired. Their plant was going to be shut down, and they had to go to Mexico and train people that were going to be earning, 
you know, a fraction of, of what a living wage is in, in Canada and actually not even a living wage in Mexico yet, right? So um, because the labor, um, the labor rights of, of workers in Mexico is, is not great. Um, and through the latest round of NAFTA negotiations, the current president of, of Mexico wanted to undertake some labor reforms. And so there has been a lot of work with unions and with workers in Mexico to raise the floor in Mexico. That has been kind of a strategy to um, raise the floor in these low wage countries so that workers there get a fair wage, but it also removes that un, unfair incentives for corporations to move to, to places where labor, where they can exploit labor and the, the governments don't protect the workers. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now I've, I've also heard, you know, the same, I'm a sociologist and I think one of the kind of areas of interest that a lot of sociologists have done is exploring the networks among these little uh, elites, you know, yeah. it's gone on a long time. It's kind of, it, it's kind of like detective work and people chortled when they find out things. There's a, a guy in uh, California, Peter Phillips, who wrote a book called Giant. And it's really, um, it's a funny book because it doesn't read like a book. It's like a directory of names of all of the richest people in the U.S. or maybe beyond the U.S. and what clubs they belong to and who they married and who this person they married is related to and yeah. what all of the holdings that they have and the and where they went to school and you can tra- you can look at the networks of school uh, chums who go on and push each other forward, you know. And oh, it's it's really like. Um, it's kind of like exploring a secret a secret club or something that these people really stick together. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we would call that class solidarity. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know these people, but I, so um, I, I wonder to what extent the remedy of the situation is as, as I immediately, I initially thought we were going to be talking about taxing wealthy people, taxing their wealth, you know, if they have a yacht, how much does it cost and how much of the value of the yacht should you pay every year on that yacht or whatever, or if you have 10 different country homes, um, et cetera, that it would be personal wealth. And it honestly hadn't even occurred to me that you're really talking about taxing corporations probably even more. Well, the, the thing is, is that these wealthy people, their wealth, a lot of it comes from corporations. So yeah. I, it should be ownership of corporations. Yeah. And so we are, so I'm talking about capital gains. That's a big part of it. But we are also talking about a wealth tax and assessing. So there are probably about 130 individuals uh, in Canada whose net wealth is over $20 million. And that would include their ownership of, of private corporations. That would include their ownership of stocks in public corporations. That would include their, their homes, their multiple homes, their um, art, their vehicles, their jewelry, that type of thing. Um, and so, and that is Canada doesn't have any kind of tax like that, right? That would be new to bring that kind of tax in. And I think that it's really important to tax that, recognizing that no one gets that wealthy without there having been something in the system broken. Like it just, it's there, there is in Canada, economic power and political power are so closely entwined. And when politicians have made promises about taxing income differently, about making the tax system more fair, they have received intense pushback from their peers who are very wealthy. And so they've never actually gotten it done because they all belong to the same class and they all have the same class interests. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we need to do both. We need to tax income better. We need to tax corporations better and we need to tax this wealth because this wealth has been built up in an unfair system. And so we need to recognize that. 
Um, and there are certainly children of very wealthy Canadians um, who believe that. And so there's a group called Resource Movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of them did a, a review of, of the book. And they said, yeah, this is absolutely their experience growing up in this class, in this society, that it was just so unequal and so completely different realities, you know, for them compared to, you know, they go to university and they meet people from outside of their social circle and they're like, oh, <laughs> right? Like not everybody has homes at Whistler and at, you know, you know, somewhere overseas and, you know, the south of France and <laughs> is personal, close personal friends with a former prime minister. And yeah, so, so there, there is a lot of work that needs to be done. And I think part of that work is just educating Canadians about how extreme it is, how well connected that elite is, mm -hmm. and how much they've been pushing back because there's more of us than them. And so if we make this, if we make politicians job contingent on being fair, then then maybe they'll start doing this work um, the way that they should have. Uh, are there any billionaires in Canada? There are at least a hundred billionaires in Canada. Um, there's um, very famous ones uh, like the owner of Shopify, Toby um, Lutke, and he's sort of one of the nicer billionaires. He's got a very uh, good outlook in terms of, of workers and stuff. Uh, there is the owner of Lululemon, um, who has not as good a reputation <laughs> in terms of, of being nice. Uh, there are the Irving family uh, who own gas stations and a whole bunch of other forestry stuff in Eastern Canada. Uh, there are the Sobeys who own a grocery store. There's the Westons who own Loblaws. There are the Thompsons who own Thompson Reuters. Their grandfather, Roy Thompson, um, established that kind of media empire and they they own a lot of of media and so we get our news we get our our information is filtered through the lens of these billionaires and um and i think we see the consequences of that in our in our media coverage uh and in the lack of diversity uh in our in our media coverage so yeah i think that there are consequences uh for our political um, discourse in Canada. Uh, yeah, uh, this whole con different conversation and one that I'd love to have okay. about, <laughs> uh, uh, about the, the distinction between regular media, the, 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 the CBCs of the world or, or the, the Globe and Mail, et cetera, and, and the social media where I probably get more of my news. I don't know. I, either way. But uh, and the disadvantages of both, because I'm really finding out they have different pluses and different minuses, but they, but they, both of them have minuses, yes. <laughs> at least. Yeah. Anyway, I don't know whether we want to pursue that, but how much would you ask for the uh, taxation, uh, tax on their personal wealth? And, and how do you appraise it anyway? You know, it, it, how how do you even know how much a person is what worth on a given day? You know, so so um, if it's the value of stocks, that would change. So you you might want to do something like the average over the year or, or something like that to make it more fair. Uh, if you're talking about the value of, of stocks, um, but that the value of houses, the value of artwork, that would all be appraised um, by an independent appraiser for, for insurance purposes, for example, right? You would often have um, the ability to, to um, verify through other sources what the value of someone's wealth really? is. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually, I mean, you might not get it all, Um if they're, they hold something in, in a different country that you don't know about, right? Like it's possible, uh, but you would get, you would get most of it for sure. Fairly straightforwardly. Okay. Yeah. And we're talking about net wealth as well. So if you're say a, a small business owner or a farmer and you have a loan to buy big equipment because, so I grew up on a farm in Saskatchewan. And so this was one of my first questions is like, 
I know a combine costs like half a million dollars. At least that's a lot of money. It's mm-hmm. uh, and you own land and 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 they're like, no, no, no. It's net. It's net wealth. Um, and it's only one percent. Uh, is the how proposal. do you mean net wealth? So if let's say you owned property that was worth twenty million dollars, mm-hmm. but you also had debt, you had loans. Mm-hmm. that were worth $10 million. Okay. So then, then you wouldn't mm-hmm. make mm-hmm. it right. Or even, okay. even, yeah. So okay. yeah, you take that into yeah. account. All right. Now, how much support does this have? I, I think Elizabeth Warren was getting a bit of traction in the U S arguing for this. I don't think that's really part of the green new deal though. Is it, did they include uh, tax on wealth as, as part of the pro- project or the program? I'm not sure, actually. That's a really good question. That's definitely part of our argument in the book is that this is something that could help fund a Green New Deal. Um, but I'm not sure because you don't need it to fund a Green New Deal. Not not right now. Um, you can definitely, governments have the ability to borrow money to fund a Green New Deal. Uh, immediately, what we're saying is that in the medium term, you want to um, you want to be raising revenue so that you're not running huge deficits kind of indefinitely because then you're, you open yourself up to pressure from your, your creditors. Um, and the way that the system works right now is that you often have uh, kind of a point where it becomes harder to borrow money as a government if, if creditors aren't happy with your balance sheet. So, but right now what we're borrowing from the Bank of Canada is sustainable. We could borrow much more uh, the United States also uh, sustainable. They're happy with the amount that they're borrowing and they feel comfortable being able to borrow more from their, uh, the Federal Reserve and to, to run deficits in the near term is not an issue. Uh, economically speaking, politically speaking, it's a different issue, but economically speaking, it's fine. It's um, when you think about the cost of not taking action, what what that cost will be. And when you consider that in the cost benefit, analysis, it definitely makes more sense to borrow the money now to take action. Uh, but um, it's speaking about the popularity of it in Canada, it's incredibly popular. There have been several polls asking about wealth taxes in general or inheritance taxes or the NDP proposal specifically, and about 85% of Canadians support it. And it's not just you know, people sort of more on the center left of the spectrum that support it. Conservatives support it as well. Conservative voters support a wealth tax because it appeals to their sense of fairness. It appeals to this sense of of justice that they work very hard. They pay the taxes that they're supposed to pay. And you see stories about these big corporations finding loopholes and avoiding paying the taxes that they're supposed to pay. And so we end up shouldering the burden of paying, paying the cost of this society and the corporations benefit from that. They benefit from us having good schools. They benefit from us having, um, you know, streets and roads that they can operate on. And so it it's only fair that they pay into it as well. And I think something that's really important is we're not talking like corporations, even though we call them people, they're not people. There are individuals within those corporations who benefit from this that are pushing policy one way or another, right? So we're talking about the CEOs, we're talking about the major shareholders. It's not the corporations themselves, they're just institutions. It's the people within those institutions that are benefiting and that are pushing policy in the direction that benefits them. Mm-hmm. Okay, that figures. But now you, I was surprised when you say that conservatives are like the idea. Yes. How, I mean, maybe a handful. But you're not going to find the Conservative Party supporting that, are you? No, you're not. And why not? And again, I mean, if conservatives support it, but of course their party doesn't, it's another one of those weird things that makes me wonder whether democracy is really democracy or not in this country or someplace well, because everything a, a thing can be very very popular for example i'm i'm very concerned about nuclear weapons and and uh, joining the uh, uh, the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons and the majority of people of course would love the idea but large majority like you know 75 percent or something and, and then you know so of course it won't happen I mean, so that disparity between what politicians do after they're elected democratically and what the population of voters uh, want 
is very troubling to me. But now you explain to me, having made my little rant, um, <laughs> why it would be that if conservatives really like the idea, why wouldn't the conservative party support it? Well, my take is, is that, so the, the liberals actually said in the throne speech that they were going to tax wealth in this budget and they didn't. They, they offered a very tiny, very marginal tax on like fancy boats and that's it, right? So they didn't actually address the core issue. They didn't raise the capital gains rate. They didn't introduce a wealth tax. They didn't touch inheritance taxes. So they said they were going to tax wealth because they know it's popular, but they made no motion towards doing it because their backers, their friends, their colleagues, their family are employed in banks and oil and gas companies and other other places where they know it would not benefit them. So they are and they're getting lobbied heavily by uh, oil and gas, by pharmaceutical companies, by banks to not do it. And so they are going to do the least amount that they can do to pacify the public. So unless so people can support a wealth tax, but are they going to go tell their member of parliament I won't vote for you unless you bring in a wealth tax. So as long as the conservatives and liberals think that it is not a vote determining issue, they're going to try and get away with not doing it. What we have to do is tell them this is a vote determining issue. I will not vote for you unless you commit to doing this. And if, you know, after four years, you haven't, <laughs> you haven't done it, I'm going to vote for someone else. I'm going to vote you out. Your job depends on making this happen. And so they are convinced that they don't have to do it um, and that they are better off listening to their donors, their lobbyists, their friends, and uh, doing as little as possible on fair taxation. Okay, what that means, if translated into similar kinds of disparities between what the politicians do and what the voters do, what this means to me is that Voters want something, but they don't want it enough to make a difference. That they, they don't want it enough to determine their, let it determine their vote. So and what I think is that voters have been convinced it's not possible. This is what Margaret Thatcher said in the 80s. There is no alternative. And this is why we wrote the book, because we wanted to convince people that it was possible. You can do this. We know what the legislative change needs to be. It's happened other places. We've done it here in the past. And, and no, corporations and wealth will not flee Canada when we do this. This makes sense. It's feasible. It's practical. And, um, and so I feel like people like it, but then they think, oh, it's not possible. And so that's what we wanted to do is convince people that it was possible. And the only reason anyone has told them that it's not is because they don't want to do it. Okay. Um, where has it been done? You say it has been done elsewhere. Where? Most other countries have a wealth tax, either an inheritance tax or a wealth tax. Um, as I said before, most countries tax capital gains at a higher rate, even than dividends. So on those two fronts, those two unequal ways that we tax wealth and returns to wealth, mm -hmm. Canada is an outlier. Mm -hmm. Okay. And can you see it in uh, the, the differential, you know, how, how much inequality there is in, in uh, personal income and personal wealth? Yes. Can you see the effect? What other countries are, are really good about it? And, and uh, well, we've said Scandinavia. I assume that that's true there. Yeah. Um, where else? Yeah, even even um, other Euro European countries like um, France or Germany have better approaches to this. There are uh, several countries that during the pandemic uh, have taken the route of implementing new wealth taxes or temporary profit taxes where they're taxing excess profits like we did in Canada during World War II. Um, so Yes, we ha we are we have seen other countries do better. And the thing about Canada uh, is that we have the infrastructure. We have funded public services better. We have funded our universities better in the past. But they have um, 
they have really suffered from underfunding. Tuition has become hugely expensive, mm-hmm. which then which then creates a, a really unequal access to education for people and a really awful start. If you're taking out huge amounts of debt to start your career, then you're not buying a house, then you're delaying having a kid. So this has huge impacts on people's lives and whether or not what their income course is. So if they they don't think that they can afford or they're not able to get um, loans to go to university, they they may join the workforce and end up with lower wages because they couldn't afford to go to school. And so what makes sense is is to have much more affordable public services, whether that's university whether that's childcare, and that spurs economic growth in a really healthy way um, in the long term. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that I I just heard a conversation about whether or not it it makes sense to actually make university tuition free. Uh, And some people say it it would be, certainly uh, superficially, it looks as if it would create greater equality because you'd have everybody with an equal chance of, of getting in. But but it, uh, there's evidence apparently that uh, because the wealthy uh, already uh, have a good, good representation in universities, that this actually is giving another break to them. Rather so that's, than- a, that's a flawed analysis, actually, because first of all, they're not making comparisons with the people who can't go to university now. So that's what we call as economists, unmet demand. So you're not measuring the people who would have gone to university and benefited from it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we have progressive income tax then afterwards, right? Mm-hmm. So that's why if we pay for free university, everybody can go, you remove those barriers uh, for people with low wages, you remove that unmet demand. Now people can meet that demand and go on to earn more money in their careers and pay it back through income taxes over their life. And so there are those who will argue against it on the basis of of so-called equality, saying, well, no, this only benefits the wealthy. But that's why you have a progressive income tax in place, because you're removing that barrier and you're allowing people to make more money and join. So it does, where it happens, where you remove that, that cost, uh, both for any kind of post-secondary education. So if you're talking about uh, for the trades, um, if you're talking about colleges, or if you're talking about universities, um, for your first degree, at least, right? Because uh, if you go to, if you do your master's or PhD, if you go on, it is free. <laughs> you get paid to go to school to do higher education. And so why wouldn't we make that bachelor's, that entry mm-hmm. level into that why wouldn't we make that free too? Um, and and so yeah, so the <laughs> there can be an argument made, but it is a flawed argument. It's missing parts of that cost benefit analysis that I talked about. I entered uh, the University of California Berkeley in 1949, and I think I paid two hundred dollars a year tuition. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what it is now, but you know. The, so both it, of my grandparents had to quit school in grade eight because it was the depression um but they valued education so much and they thought it was so important for us and i i was the first (laughs) i was the oldest grandchild and i was the first to go to university my parents both had gone to technical colleges and gotten two-year diplomas um my dad had been able to do that without even graduating from high school uh so I know firsthand how important access to education is to have that equalizing effect. I joined the Naval Reserve and I worked in the Navy to save up money to go to school because my parents owned a farm and at the time I wasn't able to get student loans. Um, So I worked and paid for school and that I am now more financially secure (laughs) than my parents were at my age because I had that access to education that I fought for. But not everybody has that uh, family support. Not everybody has the access to a job that that helps them save up money to go to school or the determination, um, knowing that that is going to pay off in the long run. Because to go back to school, it costs money and lost wages. Yeah, I've heard that the young current generation of young graduates, for example, from universities are 
are really not going to have the same level of income as their own parents. That instead of, uh, you know, we've always expected that we'd do better than our parents. You know, that was just part of the part of life, you know, but apparently it's not the case. Are there many young people who are defaulting on loans for their uh, education? So un unfortunately, it's very difficult to default on a loan uh, for education. Uh, you just carry it forever um, and pay interest on it forever. Yeah. So people end up paying back what they borrowed originally multiple times over. There is a plan. Um, there is a for the federal loans. There is if you you qualify in very specific ways that that they can forgive part of it. Mm -hmm. I'm actually not a fan. There are these debt consolidation companies now that help people consolidate their loan and prevent bankruptcy. Bankruptcy is part of the system and companies take advantage of bankruptcy all the time. You, rather than, than carrying out loans over a long period of time, you're often financially better off to go bankrupt, to default on the loan mm -hmm. and then to start over. Um, but there's social shame in that. There's a lot of pressure. Um, and so far, the amount of bankruptcies have actually fallen a huge amount, which is not good uh, for equality. Actually, it, it that tends to increase inequality as well. So um, lots of people are blocked from that access to that tool that we have in capitalism. So this is why, why I talk about the way that our capitalist system is structured, the way that the rules are made structurally benefits the rich and ties down the poor. So it's more expensive. My mom always told me this. It's more expensive to be poor. And uh, there are so many ways that that's the case. And having to borrow money to go to school is, is one of those ways where it's more expensive to be poor. Mm -hmm. Okay, now let's imagine that in a few weeks, we're going to be starting to have uh, all candidates meetings. And uh, so if I come to one of your meetings, uh, who's going to be there and what will you each be saying? If you, if you predict what are the themes of your talks, because what are the people going to want to know who attend your meetings? What, how do you see the dynamics of, of this election? And what do you want to emphasize? And to what extent does taxation of, of corporations and of personal wealth play into this? So we actually don't know in this writing who the liberal candidate is going to be. Um, Catherine McKenna, who is the current member of parliament, has decided she's not running again. And they briefly thought that maybe Mark Kearney would uh, run in this seat in her place. Uh, he has announced that he's not going to. Uh, and they haven't nominated another candidate. So hopefully they will soon. I imagine they will. Uh, but... Uh, there, the Green Party has nominated a candidate. Her name is actually also Angela, and she is also an economist. Um, <laughs> and so she has a very good uh, analysis of, you know, the Green New Deal and, and that type of urgent investment that needs to be made. And so I imagine that will be what she's talking about. Um, I will be talking about the way the promises that this liberal government won on in 2015 and 2019 what they said and drawing a distinction between that and what they've done mm -hmm. uh, because on so many fronts, they haven't done what they said they would do. Instead of taking climate action, uh, they bought a pipeline. Uh, in this last budget, they actually increased their subsidies to oil and gas companies um, and they're not investing. They promised that they would have a Just Transition Act to help workers retrain and to invest in, in um, renewable energy so that there would be jobs for workers. They haven't done that. And But also where they are working on solutions, I find they are, they are working on this broken economic model, this idea that trickle down works, that if you provide the right incentives for corporations, they will make the right decisions and good things will flow from that. And I will say, no, what you need is, what a good industrial strategy is, is actually to invest in the infrastructure that everybody needs. And then corporations will benefit from that and they 
will come here to use that infrastructure. So if we have good urban planning with bike lanes, if we have um, renewable energy, if we have public transit um, that works for people, that's affordable, then we will have vibrant cities that will attract investment from, if we have free tuition at universities, that attracts investment from corporations. Mm -hmm. And so thinking about it this way and thinking about using public money to make that investment. So borrowing um, from ourselves to build these things rather than what the liberals have tried to do, which is crowd in private investment. And so that creates all kinds of distortions where these private uh, entities are now looking for ways to make profit. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking about things that we need, uh, like public transit and bike lanes, long-term care, there is no room for profit in that. Um, when you have profit in those types of, of uh, enterprises, you end up suffering on the the service, on the quality, on the on the goal that is the public good, right? So profit takes priority over the public good. I, I know the U.S. is putting in this big trillion dollar uh, infrastructure bill, which is uh, I, I hope it passes. But uh, I I just wondered, does Canada have as much need for road repair and other infrastructure things as the U.S.? Are we lagging as far behind as they are? We have a huge deficit at the municipal level in water and wastewater, in uh, renewable energy, in building efficiency. So it might not be the same types of infrastructure that we need investment in, but we have a huge infrastructure deficit. And municipalities, as you know, can't raise money in the same way as the federal government. And so it really is the responsibility of the federal government to raise the revenue that we need to ensure that cities across Canada have the same access to the quality of infrastructure, um, especially in light of how important that infrastructure will be to the climate, uh, climate action and meeting our targets. Well, you haven't uh, mentioned uh, what the conservative candidate is likely to say. But <laughs> so it's the same lady that runs, I mean, in the past few elections. Okay. And honestly, I've never heard her say anything. So <laughs> I can't tell you. <laughs> this has been fun. I've enjoyed this and I've learned, I've learned things. You know, I never had an economics class in my life. So um, I wasn't sure whether I could even hold... A, a decent conversation with you, but it's been very stimulating, very interesting. And I think I've actually learned a little bit. Thank you so <laughs> much. I really enjoyed chatting with you. Yeah, me too. So good wishes. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.